Yeah, so maybe we'll um, give it a start. So um, welcome, everyone. So uh, our guest today is, is Jojo de Salina. Jojo is the manager of the pet center at um, St. Thomas's Hospital, so, so King's College London, the probably largest pet center in the country. So Jojo manages uh, a unit that has three pet CT and one pet MR scan. So they run a lot of projects there, a lot of research. And they've recently been awarded one of the National Total Body Pet Centers. So they're getting ready to install these, one of these large field of view uh, pet machines, which will be mostly dedicated to, to research and only part-time clinical, both to develop new methods and new technologies for pet. So Georgia's uh, background is in, in nuclear medicine. Mostly he's been very involved also in the uh, Technologies Committee in the European Association of Nuclear Medicine. He's, been involved in writing guidelines for, for scanning in, in, in different clinical scenarios. And remind me, what is your uh, British Nuclear Medicine Society role I'm at part the, of the council. So he's on the Council of British Nuclear Medicine, Medicine Society. And Society's probably role. will be part also of the RPN Committee, so the Radiography of uh, Technologies and Nurses Committee. So very involved in sort of the regulatory and, and the uh, uh, technology uh, in, in nuclear medicine. So Judge. I give this opportunity. Thanks. Oh, thanks. I think I need to speak with the mic, right? Yeah. So, thanks everyone for inviting me. And it's a great pleasure. Um, yeah, yeah, it's Alex doing it. Okay. So we have people. So, thanks everyone for, for like, and thanks Eugene, for inviting me. Thanks for that. So I'll try to give uh, a perspective of what we do in our pet center and how it is. So my talk will be mainly focused on operational, but I also will show some of the stuff that we specifically with pet MRI and attenuation correction that can be of some interest, clinical interest. Just consider that we are doing uh, a lot of other aspects of research and other things, but most of the study are not yet completed or published. So I don't have a lot to show from this aspect. But I will try to show how we work and there will be the perspective, considering that now total body pet is coming and it will be a major change and what, how we want to face this challenge because that's a challenge for many reasons. So first I like, uh, if it's possible, I would like to show you the is a five minutes uh, uh, talk that we go to the our uh, pet center. So I can start the video.
I'm going to have to reshare the, the, the actual presentation. Okay, so I'll, I just like uh, show with like what is the department, it is what we have prepared. And so you have an idea how we have done. As you can see, one thing that is like scams, I feel, I feel actually from the video, that we have quite a big structures. This structure has been opened in 2013 as it is, and has been like created with the idea of potential expansion. That was something that we have done from the beginning. So, and also in the in the in the part of like what is uh, being built, there has been a lot of things that has been built after like self built. Like for example, if you can see the prep room where we have these big screens for the staff that has been created internally by the staff. And also, I will show also something that we have done internally to reduce. So there are a lot of things we have done uh, in, with the spirit of like. Uh, protecting the stuff of uh, radiation and being ma made it more efficient during the time. And that's like, it's kind of the uh, strength. I don't know if it's uh, sharing this. Uh, is, is this sharing? So I think the green is what is being shared now. If you want to share your PowerPoint, yeah. I think you have to. Oh. Um. If we close this, and then we share the, is it this one? Is that right? Yeah. 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 Well, okay. Nice. Um, so I like um, put the title of like managing challenges and opportunities. Because as you may for sure facing, it is very challenging to run a service, especially when you have great ambitions. So what I thought, a lot of the challenge then brought there by in the same way some of the opportunities to improve it, to be a better service, to be more useful for the patients. So I tried to summarize everything that is the percentage in just one slide. So it was like the first clinical percentage in the UK and was part of both the university and the hospital, GSTT. So actually the press service is run by university, but in strict collaboration with the hospital setting. It's embedded in a school of biomedical engineering that is around now 600 people. So you have the big expertise across the board, just like I think there are more than 100 experts in artificial intelligence in the school. So it's something that we can have a big impact in what we do as well. It's an out of London. Uh, we do more than 8,000 pet here. And a lot of, uh, like, of them, are, uh, we have double reading of, uh, from the clinical point of view. Uh, we do a, we are versatile. We do uh, general anesthesia. We do some radiotherapy planning. We do pediatric. We do a lot of things that uh, are usable. We had a, previously, we were one of the first center with the inbuilt cyclotron, that is the RDS. Uh, and now we have a second cyclotron that the uh, GE traced with 16 meds that is being built in 2018. And is actually effective. The previous cyclotron is still effective and you use it as a separate uh, uh, research facility. We are tried, we had a long phase in which we were able to have a, low, a production of multiple isotopes, uh, methanin, uh, water, and a lot of uh, things. At the moment, we are in a little bit of a uh, down. So we are trying to rebuild all of these traces that we were able to produce before a GMP, a full GMP, in a full GMP. So this is the big uh, challenge for our radiochemistry and to bring back the variety of traces that we used to have in a full GMP environment. Uh, we had two discovery 710 PET-CT, one uh, Simon Bargraf MCT flow, that is in a separate room that is inbuilt in the radiotherapy of guys, can, or guys cancer center. Uh, we have more than 38 active studies and uh, 21 are in a separate study and they cover a lot of oncology, neurology, psychiatry, cardiology and other. Uh, some of the milestones was the uh, 
one of the big milestones was like in 2021, we were able to open up the lab of a full GMP that has been a great success for us because it is able to produce all research and clinical. We have two labs dedicated to uh, clinical works and one lab dedicated to research and development. Uh, so we have like uh, uh, in the last five years, everything like from scanners to scans to people publication citation, all went up more than 100%. And I will try to show you something. So these are the trajectories that we are moving. So we are looking for novel isotopes and radio pharmaceutical. We are looking to uh, ultra low dose imaging. We are waiting for total body PET and something that I will discuss. And also we are trying to implement, uh, at the moment we are mainly an oncology and neurology service, but we are trying to implement in different direction and different patient population. Uh, my focus will be uh, in the operational challenges, in the innovations and the total body fat and new traces, and also some operational performance. So some projects that uh, we have done for trying to optimize the service, waiting for what is the next challenges. Uh, we are a clinical service. We are not a full research service. So we are a clinical service that have a contact with NHS England. I think we are not one of the few that we have a direct contact without having a mediation with another external provider. It's not been easy and not been something for granted. I put these slides because it's uh, uh, something that is not that uh, granted to have a contact, direct contact with it. And it brings a lot of strength, a lot of challenges that we've been facing, but at the same time, a lot of strength. So uh, we started with 4,500 uh, scans, and we have an increase, we expect an increase of performance of 9% for every year. So we increase an increase of what we are able to do. Also, we expect a turnaround time of seven days, a request to report. And we have 11 different places commissioned. So these are the traces that we can actually perform clinically and then a uh, cost associated to it. It means that we can have a, a patient scan it at any time. And this is something that is quite the same. Recently, it's not been flagged here because it was added recently is the gallium PSMA that has a, a major role in the actual management of prostate cancer patients and became one of our strengths considering the, the clinical expertise and the ability to provide the service. So just to give you an idea how the uh, how much increased the activity during the year, we started from 4,500. We are now looking for going to 9,000 patients uh, a year. That is a massive increase of uh, the clinical output. In not many years, because we're considering just eight years. And this is another of our uh, challenges. As you can see, this is a, the breakout for months. So when we are kind of working operationally, we have an idea of how many patients we want to scan for every year, but we don't have an idea how many patients we will request we will receive every month, how much we will need. And how being able to fit all of this together with the research scan is a major challenge for the department, considering the fluctuation of this and the uh, incapability to uh, have an idea, a clear idea how many will be patients that I will be able to scan the next month and this fluctuation show. But as you can see, the trend is a major increase. Another important part is the gallium PSMA growth. So the clinical identification is mainly prostate cancer. Uh, we have massive success worldwide. We have a strong collaboration between GSTT Radio Pharmacy and the KC Health Center. But our radio pharmacy is on special measure. And this has been a kind of a big problem that we are facing at the moment. But this also has a massive impact on the patient diagnosis. And I can show which is the trend of the growth in scanning that we are facing. As you can see, there is always a big fluctuation, but we came from in 2017 with like 15 patient scanners for like for month. Now up to almost 60 patients scanned per month as an average. So it's in the four times the number of patients that we have to scan. And the expectation is much more steep than the, the, the growth of the scan. Uh, so what is the challenges that we are facing? Increased workload for staff, need of extra recruitment, operational challenge, the increase of waiting list, safety challenge like radiation protection for staff, and also patient safety. What are the benefits? We have better care for more people, potential for more investment for the department, visibility at national and international level, 
availability of data for retrospective research and interaction with different departments. We can have different patient population, we can have different traces. There will be demand for these traces because one of the problems when you have a big portfolio is also to create the demand for these people to, have, to kind of trust what you are doing. And one of the crises that we have faced in the years was the ability of having the readers, the traces, the technical capability, but sometimes like some things became unreliable, like tracer provisions. And that can be a massive downfall when you are trying to implement something that is a clinical input. So I just will go very briefly what we have in the as an equipment for radiochemistry is uh, the state of the RG cyclotron. Uh, a different target for different production, and we are working for new targets for solid target production. Uh, quality, full quality control lab with three HPLC. Um, so from today to 20, 20, May 2021, we have completely, we are working, uh, became operational under MHR license. So we are able to uh, do clinical production of the GMP. We have an R&D lab that is uh, uh, not fully GMP, but as partially GMP. Uh, two GMC grade C clean rooms, and this I think is a big richness because it's very difficult to have two grade C. Uh, 24 negative pressure of cell, two GMP grade A isolators, and several platforms to be able to perform this uh, request. What are the challenges? So we had the three floods in the last years in the pharmacy, and every time you have a flood in the clean room, basically you have to restart all the validation from scratch. We have a great pressure for the clinical delivery because we scan almost 9,000 uh, patients in a year. Uh, of them, like probably 8,000 are just uh, for FDG. So there is a big pressure of delivering things. And the validation of the is very complicated with the actual rules. And the, with the new NX1, it will be even more complicated. Also, the MHRA interpretation of the procedure is very strict. And uh, the cost of the facility is kind of uh, difficult, including the sterility in the clean rooms. What are the opportunities? Pesel became one of the three licensed providers of the DG under GMP in full UK. So where there is not much more, much more people that produce FDG except us. Making Petrace in line with the standard bring our effort to a completely different level and also show a lot of focus on compliance and patient care. Uh, this enable us to be able to trans transition the research pressure to clinical practice in the same site. Because if we have successful things, we can actually do it clinical immediately when we are able to do that. Uh, we have started producing methanin for clinical uh, scan that will be expected the first scan on the 2nd of November. Uh, we have more than 10 tracer under development work. And also the plan to produce the ATNF uh, DCTPYL that I will talk later to be used for clinical scanning patient for prostate cancer. So just to give you an idea of what is our uh, tracer pipeline, we started with FDG, methanin, we have DCTPYL, Simvesti, that is a brain imaging tracer, ammonia, that is a cardiac imaging tracer. Rubidium 82, we will not produce in the facility, but it's something that we are looking for research purpose and is connected with the total body pen. And we are looking for it for like the, the effect in um, the dynamic study for cancer patients. And also there is this big question mark about the amyloid tracer that may be the next thing that we want to produce, considering that uh, there are some therapy becoming available that may, can make it very posh and uh, set. As more talk about DCPPYL. So is the first use kind of uh, FNED, uh, in KCL. So this CPPOL is one of the many preparations of PSMA, but it proved to be the one more near to the gallium PSMA, that is the kind of the state of the art. Uh, it's a valid alternative to the established, to the established scan, and also has a great operational viability due to a longer half-life and the possibility of, to have more activity for bench. A massive reduction of postal cancer patient waiting list after the implementation. So we went down for like, we have a kind of a measure for compliance that is for us 13 days from the scan to report. We went for a compliance of about 50% of these patients to a compliance of almost 95% thanks to the implementation of this tracer. So it's a big importance for the patient because we are able, it's the first step to be able to be clinically impactful, being able to actually scan patient, which is something that we are working. Uh, we have also a big plan for technology transfers 
an internal production of uh, the CTPYL in the lab. So to have it done in house. Also, we are working on, uh, since it's something that we will talk in operational, we are trying to buy in the fact of having an automatic injector because one of the main challenges is the staff dose. When you increase the number in this way, staff dose became a concern. Every staff cannot um, become classified and can lead to a reduction of the activity. That's why we are looking for a lot of systems and we will speak about injectors later as a, an idea of something that we are trying to do to keep our operational part. So I'll go uh, very briefly in scanning. What we have now is uh, two uh, G710 specity, 120 slides and RT planning capability, uh, one MMRI PET MRI uh, scanners, and also one MCT flow in other facility. Uh, this capability is not granted. So reality in UK is mostly a single scanner department. Mobile PET is still widespread. Rarely we see traces beyond FDG. And for after 30 years, we are a unique department for many reasons. Like uh, my boss, Alexander Ames, always say, we were the first department with super scanner with a single control room. That looks like a silly thing, but it's something that is not achieved by him. And the next expectation is to have the first department with two total body pet with the same control room. And this is something that is not granted. It's not something that everyone can have. So what we're looking for is the innovation technology is the total body pet scanners. As I think uh, I give a brief introduction of what it is. So the, the part is um, what we'll bring is basically total body is uh, crossing both the capability to have a scanner for the full body capacity, as well as the ability of the, an extra ultra high sensitivity and a an massive increase of uh, uh, scanning capability, reduction of the dose and a lot of other benefits. So it can be a potentially a game changer in, uh, in this. For like people like that have PET experience, uh, we move it, there was a, a one rev main revolution in PET scanning. When we move it from the PET single scan only with to the PET CT that brought a massive evolution, that brought the evolution of technology. After that, we had some evolution, but not any real revolution because PET MRI didn't prove to be the revolutionary. It proved to be a good instrument, very valuable for some specific, but not enough to be a game changer. Total body PET, we feel that is a possibility to be a complete game changer because it opened up perspective that we were not anymore talking about. And also open up the discussion about tracers that were not anymore used because the technology were not supporting. One discussion is about zirconium that we had uh, with uh, Gigi, that is like very difficult and very bad quality user. That is, can be something that we want to use. Um, I know this is quickly about what it is, thanks. And, uh, this is what we are uh, waiting for the department. So we had the major projects in uh, the department uh, with uh, MRC. We were part of a bid together with the Imperial College. And we were able to secure one total body path for research that will arrive probably next year. We'll have slides about the plan that we are developing. So the, the new system, it will be uh, potentially, it will be one of the, not the first in UK, because the first one probably will be roughly, but one of the first and will be Hans Edinburgh, and there will be some other, potentially some other center that may have it. Um, this kind of will be mainly dedicated to research, but we expect to be having some use and also to pave the way to research to an extensive use also for clinical perspective. So can bring innovation in variety of fields such as clinical oncology, cardiology, personal medicine, drug development, and toxicology, inflammatory infectious disease, the main things we can do dynamic scans. That's something that we were not able, to, we were able to do in PET only for a uh, specific part of the body. While here we can do for all the aspects of the body. So there is a major growth of this potential. And the ultra high detection sensitivity and the enhanced temporal resolution enable us to do something that we are not able to do before, like late imaging, uh, reduced dose imaging, and other part of that. So image faster and traditional techniques, less semester radioactivity, perform total body dynamic acquisition, and acquire images at a longer delayed time point. 
What is the plan? So the government support of research scanners is to be installed in 2024. The second scanner focused on clinical to be installed in 2025. And the pattern reform is adaptation to the new requirement. Also, we have an expectation of different scale of research output and massive increased output for clinical. And that's brought us to the idea of increase the number of fact they gave from eight to 10. This is what like was the change that we are expecting for the department. As you can see on the left is the department as it is, has been shown in the video. And we expect to change it uh, with a couple of new update base and the positioning of the two. As you can see, the expectation is to have two total body pet that will be different from the previous one, but it's fitting in the in the service. This is due to the fact that when we thought about it, there was much space for this kind of uh, activity. Also, we will be able to retain all the extra equipment that we have, like laser for radiotherapy planning, uh, O15, the water distribution for, um, and uh, O15 distribution for like, but that is still embedded in the service and we will be able to retain. So what is really important that we are not completely changing our setting. Uh, performing research, how much? So we had an increase recently. We have over 2,700 citations in 2021. And as you can see, besides the challenges that we are facing, our output in research is increasing massively, the threefold one. And what we are researching for? Uh, patient care in lymphomas, no ways of radio labeling molecules, PET MRI, like uh, the patient, like epilepsy surgery. Also, what we want to do is like performing research for lower dose for staff, better images, better pets and spear. One thing that we are like uh, an example that what total body pet can benefit is the fact that at the moment for in MRI, for example, there are some research protocols that just add a research scanning, research path in the MRI scan, something that we cannot do in pet city because it's not part of the with total body pet, we actually can do this path. We can add a dynamic on a scan, we can add a different play point without having an extra dose to the patients. And this is something that has not been possible till now, mainly for operational challenges, also for the uh, quality of the scan that we have. So there is a massive potential to have also in the clinical area to be able to perform research on some specific patients that is not being possible in the actual uh, setting. I just show some of the epilepsy research that we are doing. So at the moment, we already have a fully dedicated research camera that is our PET MRI. It is work on oncology, neurology, epilepsy, and dementia, and also cardiology, sarcoidosis, perfusion, and cardiotoxicity. So these are the projects and trajectory of the department. We discuss some big projects involved in total body PET and validation of new tracer. But the fact is, can this project be related only on massive investments? Uh, performance, safety, and staff satisfaction can be helped with, without this big investment. And the idea that we want to strive for excellence in everything we do. And I'd like to try to show some of the attitude of the PET center that has been in the year. So some examples. Uh, fingertip dose. So the PET center scan up to 50 patients a day using three PET CT and one PET. The group is nine radiographer technologies. Uh, fingertip dose is high and the reason for classification. One large fraction of those come from active dispensing and the injection. So this is one of the big problems because if we uh, have the staff cannot even increase in the number of staff, we cannot actually perform it. Not our body pet wing. Uh, expect maybe to be able to scan six patients plus research patients in an hour. And it's something that needs to require some work. So at the beginning, we look for some in-house solution and it's something that we have been showing. So this has been built in-house. It's a uh, used once a dose dispenser. So it's basically a system to have the uh, syringe in a lead shield, super, uh, surrounded by metallic. And the in inside there is a, uh, a lead ca a carry pit inside. So the, as you can see, uh, the, the syringe is shielded and we have an extension that goes directly to the patients. And in this way also, we have a Perspex view windows that allow us to see if the injection is happening correctly. This, when it was implemented, 
brought a big reduction of the fingertips dose to the patient, as you can see, especially in the, when you look at the total procedures that we have. However, recently we had some issues with the extravasation reports because the increase of uh, uh, activity brought some extra extravasation, some other problems with extravasation. And this led to a, uh, one case in which this uh, was reportable to CQC. We had uh, need to change the practice. And that's why we implemented the Intigo injector. That is something that I suggest. I worked with in the, my previous task and I also suggest. This is the mainly because the give us a much better accuracy. And basically the dose to the patient, to the staff is almost zero. Also give a lot of better satisfaction to the patient that is much more likely. However, when we implemented, we had a lot of concerns, especially in the accuracy on the injector activity. In our reporting, we uh, passed a lot of the SUV calculations. So having inaccuracy in the injections is a really a big problem. We had a long work, we had done a long work to uh, validating our calibrators to ensure that what we calibrate is the exact activity. And we wanted also to uh, validate the activity of the that like what is injected by the Intigo is exactly what we really want. So uh, also with the real problem with expensive consumables, patient satisfaction, will patient like it? Staff satisfaction, will pay, uh, staff will use the food? And a lot of the things that were connected, like the connectivity with the system, were not really implemented on, and, uh, in the department. So we had done a, a small work about the assess the pet injection system. And here, even here, we are like uh, we like to build things in house. Basically, we create the system that allow us to simulate the injection in the patients. What we have done, basically, the idea of all this uh, project is to ensure that what we inject and what we really transfer to the things and what we the injector says that is transferred to the patient is what actually is injected. So we created this tubing that was simulating a, a patients, nothing, and also we have. Uh, we simplified the, what we had injected to ensure that it's all the block. And we put in the calibrator to see what it was. As you can see, the standard deviation was really good. And the accuracy system is in the 5% that we are uh, considering as an accuracy. That's to show that when you are uh, implementing something for clinical use, and especially using now um, PET-CT for it is also a quantitative uh, system, the way that you need to control accuracy of what you implement is not that easy as it may seem, and they can have an impact in the clinical aspect. Um, so now we implemented it in our uh, system. And also the fact that why we move it to it, the cost of consumable is quite high, but we are the only system that are able to have a cyclotron in house. So it means that when we are not receiving from an external provider multiple doses that we have two big vials that can be perfectly fitting without having to change all the system and all the line. And this created major cost benefit to them. This is also in the thinking about the increased uh, output that we will have for total body pet. We cannot like uh, open a service and at the same time expect an increase because the point when the total body pet will be available, there will be a massive demand. To use it. And this is will need to be prepared to increase the output immediately when it is delivered. So this is what we have done in uh, implementing that and being sure before that we had the crisis of having the extra output that we have a system. This I presented this part to uh, confirm what, uh, how much you need to plan in advance when something happens to ensure that what you have the output of the images is actually clinically effective. Another thing that we are working on is the uh, uh, pediatric pet with GA. So we scan more than 70 pediatric patients a year with general anesthetics. Most indications are for epilepsy and they require the scan before surgery. Uh, at the moment, we are like working, still working for an extra funding because there is not at, uh, at all commissioned by NHS England. So what we are doing is basically repaid as uh, a, normal, a normal pet scan. While at the, actually we have all the system for GA and one of the reasons of the big department is also to allow that because for doing two patients of the thing, we literally had to block a camera for a full afternoon. And it's just to scan three patients that we are doing for GA. 
for GA. And uh, we have almost one year of uh, waiting times for that. Uh, so why not PET MRI in the meanwhile? So the current practice is with PET CT, uh, but PET MRI could be a great solution for that. And this is what we are working. So as an aerosol, at the moment, PET MRI, we have an aerosol problem, problem with attenuation correction. The main uh, issue is that we don't have a large validation data set for MRI in children. So we cannot really have that. So that's what was one of the points that we are working is to attempt to use the adult training data to assess the pediatric I see. So I'm going to show you a small part that we are working. And we are trying to validate uh, one of the, uh, validate the new algorithm about uh, the uh, use for, uh, for PET MRI, uh, creating a pseudo CT that like uh, we will use for then the attenuation correction. Uh, what the, we what we did was to basically scan both the patients on the CT for the adult and also having a scan on the PET MRI, uh, creating a kind of data set that we can use to a system for, for uh, using artificial intelligence. This is, you can see the difference between the attenuation correction and the error that we have been working for the brain. Uh, it's possible to do that. But the difficulty in a quite large number of uh, MRI and CT data sets is creating a, an issue about like the affidability of the service. On top of that, the GA, the PET MRI has a lot of problems uh, MRI, uh, being MRI scanners in having extra people trained coming in and uh, using the system for like for pediatric and, asset, and uh, performing a, G, a general anesthetic. So this is one of the paths we have also, we still have an error of 20% in some of the bone structures. That does not allow to be completely confident in using this system. But it's a start. It's a start for something that is, will be probably our main use for PET MRI. And also will allow us to get a, a better um, capacity in waiting for total body PET that may reduce the number of people that require GA, considering that we can potentially scan a patient in just 30 seconds. Uh, tests with patients still need to be performed. And now I'm gonna show you something about what are new clinical applications for uh, PET MRI. So a cardiac PET and cardiac MRI are seen as fundamental therapy step in cardiac. So, and we are at the moment performing mainly cardiac PET for uh, inflammation. We are not doing perfusion PET, even if there is a, an idea to start doing perfusion PET with ammonia and eventually rubidium. At the moment, MRI is considered to have a higher sensitivity, but similar specificity to PET. But what PET MRI can offer is one-stop shop solution for uh, many cases. So using PET MRI for clinic, I could reduce the press on the PET modality, and even if it's done after financial loss, because it just members of the capacity. But what we are looking for is the benefit of the patient that will not have to do a double procedure for these cases. Uh, MRI-based attention correction sequence are created uh, with these uh, softwares, and they are quite satisfactory. While we are not uh, completely happy with what we are doing with the brain, we are quite happy with what's happening with the chest. One of the things that we need to perform that is a cardiac, uh, is a kind of a double expertise in the in the people performing the scan that they need to have a cardiac MRI experience. One of the issues with cardiac uh, PET MRI that the sequences are not simple sequences for PET MRI. So the uh, expertise needed from the radiographers and technologists is something that needs to be uh, increased to a very high level to be able to perform these aspects. I, this is how the PET MRI works. So uh, integrating PET components together with things. Our system is uh, um, the Siemens One is a complete, so it's enabled to have the PET scanning and the MRI scanning happening at the same times. And this is really important when you are dealing with the positioning and the setting up of the patients. Patient positioning is much more complicated than the standard PET scans because it requires coils that requires a position that is not the standard position ones. And also 
we need to consider the potential that the MRI cardiac MRI scanner is a long scan. It can be a more than 45 minutes scan, I don't know, one hour scan going together. So we need to face the potential of having claustrophobic patients and the uh, situation. But at the same time, they are radioactive patients and that we need to deal with. Uh, we have also specifically dedicated SEG stickers that need to be used. And specifically, uh, monitoring that needs to be used that can be used only for the MRI part. Uh, we need to ensure that the SCG signal is uh, uh, keep stable during all the performance of the thing. Also, we have an injection of contrast, and we need to have everything happening in a stable situation. That is not easy to obtain when you're talking about long scan. We are using also a respiratory bellow to monitor the uh, vital signs of the patients. And uh, we need also to give instruction to the patient to uh, be able to brief uh, correctly according to the what we are like um, to what we are our expectation and to ensure that is uh, uh, compatible with uh, the scanning for the MRI. Also, we have a different system for the uh, injection because we cannot really uh, we have a dedicated dynamic pattern of injection totally for something that is not. Uh, um, affected by the magnet to avoid uh, things. But like what we have is a very, very, very nice images that we are having. You can see this for the cinemod, the left atrium and the ventricle. That is really, really, really nice because it's in uh, MRI. And also the chamber view is really, really uh, well. This is uh, like uh, one of the other sets that we can perform. And we have also this option to have the cinetic path that is really interesting in the MRI path that we can compare to what we have the infection. To these images, to this imaging, we can add the, like the path of the DFTG. So we can much better locate where there is the path that we expect of an infection. Consider that also the path, the path that we are like, uh, uh, with the, this patient needs to be prepared with a dedicated diet. It is very difficult to follow. A dedicated no carbs uh, that allows us to have a complete suppression of the heart. But also the cardiac MRI help us when there is a, not a complete suppression to locate some of the uh, finding that we have in the proper, uh, giving the like a anatomical structure that can correlate with this aspect. So I can show you the nice image of fusion. We have the 3D wall heart MRI. The PET is, this one is without the attenuation correction. And this is the 3D wall heart MRI with uh, the attenuation correction that is provided by the algorithm that we are uh, using. As you can see, this kind of information is very clear and can be really very well assessed. And the same way, the quality of where it is like the combination of the two give us a much better instrument for this type of diagnosis. And this is the other uh, um, the other um, view, the short axis view that is compatible. You see how it is compatible, the two parts, and how it like feels well, giving us a complete view. This enables us to spare time for the patients that can have a unresolved PET CT or an unresolved uh, MRI. In this way, it's very difficult that we have an unresolved. And we are kind of addressing a certain number of patients directly to PET MRI to guarantee that they have like a time. Also, we need to consider, uh, maybe I'm boring you about the uh, waiting time, but scanning, a, having the ability to scan a patient in the time that it needs to be scanned is a major uh, importance of what it is. With PET MRI, not at the moment, we have a capacity considering the uh, after COVID, the, the ramping up of the research has not been uh, completely uh, using. So we have some cap clinical capacity that allows us for this patient that requires a very quick, uh, that may have to wait a certain time for the for both of the modality, to have a much quicker uh, thing, so with a very high quality uh, performance. So what's next? So uh, new types of developer for clinical research use every year. Radiotherapy planning can be something that we are looking, especially in the collaboration of guys with the other scanner. Uh, engagement with an think of the tracer commission, amyloid is something that we are working on. Developing of PET-CT beyond 
oncology. That is something that maybe with the new total work is something that we will be able to grow. And I give some uh, conclusion. So from great project come great responsibility. One of the main uh, issues that has been raised uh, when there will be the total body PET, uh, especially for clinical use, is if we will have a like first division patients or second division patients. So what we are trying to do, like in, uh, working in side projects together with the main project of total body PET, to guarantee that we at least what we are doing in the same size is all first division. And we are trying to personalize what we are doing to the, all the type of uh, patient that we scan. Uh, what I want to show also how difficult and how many details are needed to uh, develop, deliver high quality care. Even like it's not enough to buy a new scanner and say, I can scan 10 patients an hour. I mean, actually you need to do that. And one of the things that really I feel that is uh, uh, that sometimes it's easier to get an equipment that actually make it effective in the setting. So it's mainly probably, uh, maybe I focus on this talk about that, how it is the role of having, of being able to deliver for what is the technology and also to be able to deliver consistently high quality care. That is not something that can be done easily. So that part that can be a game changer, but it's not cannot be a game changer alone. If you don't create a setting altogether with a culture of improving, the culture of testing what you are doing versus the evidence, if you don't create a culture of like uh, a proper use and a proper uh, the quality delivery of what you are doing. And another conclusion that not the partner is an island, so we are working a lot about the pet user community, need to collaborate for mutual benefit, uh, consortia, user groups, scientific associations. I still feel, uh, I'm involved in many associations, I've been involved in associations for a lot of times. I still feel that we are a little bit uh, separated in the group. When I had the tour today with uh, Gigi, I found out that probably my talk was not what I wanted to present. If I have to do it again, I will present other things because I felt like I didn't know very well what we were doing. And this is something that I may have wanted to uh, uh, to focus. But this has showed how, how it's important to have this kind of uh, uh, sharing. So inviting you, and I hope I'll be able to invite uh, Gigi as well in my department. We'll be able to uh, get a more vision about what is happening in different centers and, most, and then maybe to work together on a lot of things. And also when it's about uh, uh, sorting uh, um, challenges, is about uh, trying to get the experience of other people in the same challenge. That's what we are working on, especially for like the new total body pack in the big user groups and big uh, work uh, together. And not to say the part about the lobbying, some of the challenges that I showed were about the work with the regulatory, what we have. If a one center trying to work with the regulatory, there's no hope. The only way that we can do is uh, sharing the same problem and try to find solution all together. This is a place that has been told me by a professor of Fenagel as kind of one of the uh, more influential uh, nuclear medicine physicians. The nuclear medicine is worth more enough to be friends. I feel that imaging as well is not a world so big and there can be a some place where it needs to be friends. So, and it's something that I really like to, I always put in my talks because I feel like the sharing of uh, challenges, not only sharing how good we are, is something that can benefit the full the full community for the imaging. This is the department open it. And here is like if you want some details about the PET MRI, I put some context uh, person. And thank you for the attention.